This is episode 10 of Kotaku Split Screen, and we still don't have a music intro because Kirk Hamilton is very lazy. Here's Spend the thing. his Thanksgiving here, playing here, video games. Here's the thing. We might have a musical intro. We're actually living in a liminal state right now, you and I, where it is possible that there was music that played just before this. And I recorded it and composed it after we uh, recorded this so it is possible that there is music just throwing that out wait there. so you're saying you're saying that what i just said might be a lie well yeah because you always begin these podcasts with a lie this is what i'm saying this is a real problem <laughs> actually that'd be fun we should we should just stick a lie into every single into the beginning of the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> and, not... see, and see if people figure it out like figure out what it the could lie be a fun is. game like and then the ultimate lie the at the very end we can reveal that this wasn't actually me and you doing the podcast and that we're like you know <laughs> aliens or something and that will be the ultimate we're lie we're yeah we're since <laughs> My name is Jason Schreier, and this is Kirk Hamilton. Hi, Kirk. Hi, Jason. How's it going, man? Uh, good. Uh, I had a nice little vacation there. Uh, sorry, listeners, that we, we skipped last week's Thanksgiving episode. We were going to do something special for Thanksgiving, but decided not to. Um, and by decided <laughs> not to, <laughs> I mean we, we just didn't. We just did it. Well, we did. I mean, I did something special for Thanksgiving. It just wasn't a podcast. <laughs> right, right, right. That's yes. That's what I mean. That's what I'm saying. Thank you, Mr. Literal over here. Yeah, I thought I would just take you as literally as possible. Um, how was your Thanksgiving, man? How was it? Uh, it was good. Uh, I ate a lot. I took a few days off. I played a lot of uh, video games, some Trails in the Sky, some Fallout. I think I've kind of given up on Fallout. Uh, I, I got to the point where uh, there's a twist and then called it quits and was like, I don't really want to play anymore. Um, it, it Actually, Fallout... Well, well, so Fallout 4 has made me think long and hard about a lot of things. And there's a question that I wanted to ask you, Kirk. Yeah, all right. Which Fallout 4 has made me think about. Um, so Fallout 4 comes out, right? And you get all these reviews from people who have been playing the game nonstop for like two weeks since whenever mm-hmm. they got review copies. Um, and most people were pretty psyched about it. And uh, Bethesda games tend to make you pretty psyched as you're playing them. And it keeps making me ask myself this, this question about reviews and reviewing video games. And it ke- I keep coming back to the idea that video games are re- impossible to review <laughs> until like you've had a month or so or like a like a great deal of time to really let them sink into you like it feels like Fallout 4 is this game that you can be hot on one second cold on another second um it's like you're living in this world for a while uh, if you spend an entire week playing nothing but Fallout 4 of course you're going to be high on it and like say all these great things that you might not feel the same way about after you've let it sink in for a while and I don't know this is like I've been feeling this weird ambivalence and like frustration at the idea of like like criticizing video games and how video games are such a time consuming and like unique form of media that I don't think they can be critiqued and reviewed in the way that movies and books can. You know what I mean? Um, I mean, yeah, I, you know, I, of course, like video games pose their own challenges for, for reviewing or, or criticism. Like, you know, I, I definitely don't agree that, that there's nothing that you can't... Re- I mean, I think, like, for example, I think Patricia's Fallout review was great. It captured a lot and had a lot to say about the game. It wasn't some rose-tinted, oh my gosh, I love it so much, I'm obsessed kind of thing. Though, I mean, we see that sometimes, I think, from maybe from but weaker But hold on. So, critics, okay, but... so Patricia's, Patricia's... Sorry to interrupt you. No, no, no. Kirk, I know, you, I know how much you love being interrupted. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Um, but Patricia's review is great, and then she came out with another piece yesterday about how Fallout 4 is, like, not for Fallout fans, and I thought that was more compelling than the review, and I thought it elaborated on the review in a way that makes it feel more thorough, but if you're gonna say, like, a review is this thorough evaluation of a video game, then I think the review of Fallout 4 would have what she wrote in the review, and then also this, and also the thoughts that crystallize as she continues to play the game more and more. And, like, this is the type of thing where you keep playing this game and you keep thinking these things, and there's no way to thoroughly evaluate it after a week or two weeks. Yeah, I mean, the idea that a review needs to be complete, I think, is uh, is is, nev- is self-defeating. Like, you're never going to get there with a review if you think, okay, this needs to be a complete review. I mean, there are some, it used to be more possible, I think. Uh, Keith Stewart, right, just wrote a thing for The Guardian about this. And Stephen and yeah. I actually have been, have been talking about 
uh, Kotaku reviews and how we're approaching them. So, and uh, you know, we're, we're maybe going to be changing some things next year. We'll see. <laughs> um, I'll tease that now. But uh, but yeah, I mean, review video game reviews are hard. I've been writing them for you know a while now, and have thought a lot about how we can do them best. It's different. That one of the big challenges is it's different for every kind of game, right? Like. Um, the Room 3. I could play through The Room 3. I've been playing that game. I could review that game, and it'd be a complete review. That's a game that I'm not going to feel differently about in a month. Fallout 4 is a game that's super huge. So, yeah, like you said, we feel differently about it. Then there's a game like Dota or something, you know, like that is, is closer to a sport. <laughs> like, how, do, how would you ever review that? But at the you same can. time, well, but I would greatly admire a smart critic who could write a really cool review of Dota 2. I would read the hell out of that. And it doesn't have to be permanent. It doesn't mean the person's view of the game can't change. Um, like you know, like you said, I think Patricia's review stands fine as an evaluation of the game alongside uh, that cool article she wrote this week, uh, which was about sort of how Fallout has changed. I also think in her in her, that piece she talked about her review and how like this idea that she didn't evaluate Fallout Four in terms of the Fallout legacy because her review is more focused on this game and what it is and whether it accomplishes what it sets out to accomplish. And I think that's probably a good approach or at least a more a sensible approach is to just say, does this game do what it sets out to do? Is it fun? You know, what does it do? As just a sort of basic evaluation. But there's so many different things that a review can be. It can be buyer's advice, which is certainly helpful, I think, for a lot of people. Games are expensive. They want to know if they're good. It can be something that allows insight into the game. It can be so, you know, it can be a ton, it can be social commentary. It can be performance art. It can be like a comedy piece. It can be a million different things. And maybe maybe that's the problem fine. is that the I, word review. For me. Maybe the problem is that the word review implies this thoroughness that that might not be there. Yeah, I mean, I think it's okay. Like, it's a I think it's a kind of a potent word, and it is loaded because, like you said, it's we can't evaluate these things the same as we do movies and um, you know and other things that get reviews, like quote review unquote. Um, it's a different thing with games, and certainly video game reviews have a weird history i i personally like it i like the sort of rhetorical weight of the word and i like like saying you know fallout 4 the kotaku review i actually the kotaku review yeah, i enjoy that so like definitive. i like that better than we've talked about this plenty of times you know we're constantly you, i think kotaku has probably changed our review format more times than maybe any other gaming site um yeah and I think the headline, though, has been the same throughout because I like that. It's, it's something about yeah, it is it's striking, and it says review. this is what we think of this game. And, of course, that's right. not to say that it, that won't change, but, but yeah. Yeah, uh, it's interesting. And, by the way, uh, uh, I forgot to mention we, we have to give a hearty congratulations to Kirk Hamilton, uh, who is now the deputy editor that's right. Com. Uh, yeah, I guess this is our uh, first. Uh, is this our first podcast since that happened? Thanks, man. Since you were promoted, yeah, congratulations, man. Thanks. I am uh, now responsible for every stupid thing Kotaku has ever done. So you know, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, but the you buck now the... stops. The buck now stops here. So the buck now stops here. Um, so congratulations, uh, hearty, hearty congrats. Uh, Thanks, man. Kirk, deputy editor. It's, it's a cool title. You yeah, it is. It is you cool. It's funny because my old, so my old title was features editor, which was actually the title I was hired with, and that, you know, it it made sense, like in that I edited a lot of reviews and worked with freelancers on features, but it's also kind of a weird title where deputy editor actually yeah. means something, which is nice. <laughs> like, so yeah, right. I'm excited. Right. Yeah, yeah, it's nice. It feels like we're have, we have more structure now, and we're getting a managing editor soon, so that'll be mm-hmm. good. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, so back to the reviews thing, real quick. So. Um, I, yeah, I, I think maybe maybe one of the problems is that it feels too definitive when we say review and stuff comes out later that makes us kind of change our minds about games. And there are a lot of games that have been kind of reviewed positively or even reviewed negatively only for the critical consensus to emerge later in the polar opposite direction. Yeah. And maybe the other problem, and that's not even mentioning review scores, by the way, which are mm-hmm. nonsense and also carry this weight of like, this game is a seven, this game is a nine. Yeah, and um, to be fa- and in fairness, you know, Kotaku, I think, actually does have that problem with our reviews. And this is something we've been talking about is that, you know, yes, our latest no. system has been this yes, no, not yet system. And I think that system has some problems. Like, yeah. um, I've speaking of like rhetorical, potent rhetorical things that I've enjoyed, I sort of enjoy the yes, no, or I have in the past. Because there's just something enjoyable about it. I don't know. Like, I don't take that stuff as seriously as some people do. And I think, right. but I, you know, I think it's confusing for readers 
and it's, it can be challenging for us as well when like a game is kind of like fuck this game like we don't really like it and we give it a no that yeah. no can be very limiting in a way um because there are plenty of games that i would say no don't play this game this game is fuck this game but at the same time i would have plenty to say about it or it's interesting uh-huh. or you know like it's it can be challenging and that and let alone you know giving a score which is even even harder saying like oh well, this game is a six but now i want to say all these things about it and people yeah, i don't like that also is confusing so right verdicts yeah. are tough yeah and, and well so it's not only that it's also i think this is something i keep coming back to when i think about games in general i think the idea of a video game is just so in, all encompassing like it includes so many different types of things mm-hmm. that i think that is a fundamental problem with the way we approach games criticism is that we look at everything as a video game and like tonight we're recording this on thursday this will probably be out on friday so the game awards will have already happened but they're naming, this is like supposed to be the big award <laughs> show, right? The big, the Emmys or the Oscars of video games. And there's this idea that there's a game of the year, and that is the game of the year, which to me is so silly because there's so many different types of games of the year. Uh, they're like, like a video game could be anything. It could be Undertale. It could be Metal Gear Solid. It could be, I don't know. Last year, my game of the year was threes, but how do you compare threes to like the latest? Can you imagine? I would love that so much if the game, if the game awards gave threes game of the year. Man. (laughs) Yeah. It'd be cool. It'd be a cool world. This year it should be Box Boy. How come Box Boy is not nominated for anything? I'm, I'm currently anyway, looking. I'm I looking up the list the of nominees is, right now. I want to look at the. You are okay. Yeah, I'm looking. At some, them. Go we ahead. should talk about that. Yeah, we should talk yeah, about. Yeah, yeah, I think that'd be bit. fun. But, but. but this idea that video game means so many different things, that's something that, that I keep coming back to and have for a while. And I think that's a problem in the way we approach things. And, like, you see it in the Internet discourse when people are like, oh, Gone Home, that isn't a video game. Or, like, mm-hmm. uh, uh, Sibel, that was the most recent one that you played and really enjoyed, that mm-hmm. game by Nina Freeman about uh, uh, a sex adventure, right? Uh, <laughs> I, guess sex I, would, adventure. I guess I'd call it a sex adventure, <laughs> sure. Um but yeah, but like I think that maybe the name video game just is a problem, and maybe we need to get away from that. I, I mean, I think we're it, we're in the middle of sort of evolving our language on it. I don't know. I mean, I think that enough people are familiar enough with what you're talking about when you say that 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 it that it counts. And you know, I mean, we could I, let's not even get in. Like, we could debate what is a video game and what isn't. But I mean, I think we both agree that basically. Anything no, that... anything's a video game. Yeah. No, that's not what I mean. I, I just mean I don't think that like treating games like Metal Gear Solid the way we treat games like Sabelle and Undertale, I, I, there's something fundamentally wrong with that. And there's right. something fundamentally wrong with the fact that Kotaku might run a review of that in the same way. Uh, I mean, uh, I don't know about that. Again. Like, I think that, like, in any media, you're going to have that kind of a thing. And, I mean, like, it's like reviewing a documentary versus reviewing a, like, Netflix or a YouTube short film versus reviewing The Godfather. I mean, those are all different, too. Like, it, there's there are similarities in the media that are worth, you know lumping together and you can't i mean there's no real alternative like at this point if you're into video games you're probably checking out all of this stuff or at least a lot of it and any good um you know criticism review site is going to have critics who are better versed with different types of games like you know you can review a jrpg far better than i can um uh, another writer might be able to write about an esports game better than you or i could like it's you kind of just have to start specializing but that doesn't mean that I don't know that the system is broken. It just means that it's sort of evolving. I mean, I agree. Like, yeah. The, so, go ahead. If you're specializing, if we have a, an esports person and a JRPG person, then how do you decide which which gets the game of the year? Who well, yeah, that's. I mean, game the of the game? year is silly, but it's no. I mean, honestly, like, I think the game of the year. All awards are silly. Like the fucking Academy <laughs> Award for Best Picture is silly. Like that they never nominate. Or, like the Grammy Awards. Like holy shit. Like if if you follow the Grammy Awards, they're just a joke. Like they never, they never. <laughs> it's like it's the same shit. Like it's the same thing as as anything. Like it's the best movie of the year was probably not the thing that won Best Picture. The best album of the year. Birdman. No, was Birdman not was the thing it. that won not... Best Album of the Year at the Grammys. It was probably something you've never heard of, or like the, a million different things. Like it's always the big corporate stuff that gets nominated it's always the the albums everybody guesses it's always the games like i'm looking at the the game of the year awards it's so predictable like 
Fallout 4, <laughs> Bloodborne, Metal Gear 5, Super Mario Maker, The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt. I mean, even among those games, they're all good games, I think. Do I think they're all good? Yeah, I agree that Fallout 4 has some issues. They're all good, though. I mean, I liked them all, but like... I bet know, The Witcher I don't know. Like, what? Yeah, there's, there's so many games that aren't on that list, and there are also more problematically there are games that just could never be on that list like the way that there's right. like a best indie game best downloadable game because they have to right that's right that's the, the yeah. ghetto where you put all this game right like oh undertale gets best indie game or something did it actually get that right where that game is um i haven't still haven't played that game but like um i mean played what's much the what are the nominations for best indie game I'm trying to load it on my phone, <laughs> but it's going really slow. When looking at developer of the year, that's kind of funny. Okay, let's see. Best independent game. What? There. This. Okay. Wait. Really? Oh, that's cool. <laughs> oh, this is a good. Okay. The, the, the independent. Wait. No. Yeah. Okay. Let's just listen to your reactions of them. Let's not actually. <laughs> I don't want to like, hear the mm, list. Oh, that's Wait. Really? Oh, that's well, cool. Well, re- mm. um, okay. <laughs> independent game award nominees. Axiom Verge. Okay. Okay. Didn't love That's it, but the, whatever. That's the Metroid like. Um, her it was story. Fun. Okay. Or the indie? blind. Uh, yeah, that's an indie. I think it's Sam Barlow made that game. It's like a very small team made that game. Uh, her okay. story. Ori and the Blind Forest. That's Rock- not an indie. Wasn't that published by Microsoft? Well, yeah, but it's. I think it, I guess it's an independent developer made it. Uh, Moon Studios made that game. What? Um, what? Rocket Wait, hold on, League. hold on, League. hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, pause. Okay, Ori and the gonna, Blind Forest. If a game is go, published, go ahead, go ahead. if a game is published by a multi-billion-dollar studio, corporation, whatever, it cannot be an indie game. Well, we're gonna. I mean, okay, let's let me finish the 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 list and okay, then we can finish. debate this. Okay, so Ori and the Blind Forest, Rocket League, and Undertale are the nominees for best independent game. Yeah, I mean, something's off, right? <laughs> like, Rocket <laughs> League. <laughs> like, I mean, I guess right, it's independent. Yeah. Did like. Wait, who published Rocket League? I actually don't know. I'm assuming maybe they just self-published that, like, because that was on PC and and PS4. Um, um, let me let me check. But I've been getting, I mean, they have a PR team. They have Reverb, so, well, so they are not then, an indie. Okay, they I have think a PR team. Rather than go down <laughs> this rabbit hole, because we could talk about it forever, I think maybe we can just say that the fact that there is even a list of independent like that there's a category for independent developers is dumb because this already is like what like why why should i be judging rocket league and ori and the blind forest and undertale on a different metric than gta or uh, metal gear 5 and the witcher 3 like what what like also like how is i mean cd project red is an independent studio they're not owned by anybody they're their own publisher like how is that not an independent game when moon studios or the blind forest is like how are they different except in scale right so this is like a it's already just a stupid uh, delineation yeah wait a minute cd project red yeah that's more they're of an, an independent indie studio the witcher 3 is an indie game <laughs> yeah they should indie game of the, year. the witcher 3 and ori and the blind forest it's would that be show. awesome if the witcher 3 was in the independent game category it should be Man, right, according to whatever these, really this weird logic is. Actually, I think the worst thing about the Game Awards is that uh, they group together mobile and handheld. <laughs> oh, really? As so one it's like, category. I don't think I'd even put that together. Um, so it's like 3DS games and iPhone games. Yeah, yeah. That's funny. Is, oh, I should, I'm gonna look at what the cate- what the nominees are. Okay, yeah. It'll take us, a minute. Give us the nominees. Oh, best mobile handheld game. Yeah, here we go. Yeah, best mobile slash handheld funny. game. We should say we're knocking this. Honestly, like I admire Jeff Keighley a lot for putting this together. I should throw that out there. Like I think it's really, he's worked really hard on this. I admire him in general. I think he's like a really, you know, he works just super hard and like obviously gives a huge amount of shits about this and really like put it together, which is cool. And as much as we're knocking it, I, I don't know. I mean, award shows are always <laughs> a little bit silly. So, but okay. Anyway, back to knocking. It's, it's come a long way since. <laughs> no, uh, yeah, since it's better, the, right? It's better, and it's fun. I don't know. In, like, in, we we haven't in posted 2011. There was there was oh, tea God. bagging. There was uh, <laughs> uh, the dude tea bagging the people who spoke too long on stage. Remember that? Yeah, I remember your article, right? That was like I think that was before we worked together. That was just like holy fuck. Yeah. I don't remember like <laughs> what the article was beyond like this is just an embarrassment. Yeah. Um, okay, so best mobile handheld game. Downwell. Okay. I haven't played that. I've heard that's really, really good. The Idle Thumbs dudes are always talking about that game. Um, mm-hmm. I should really play it. It's apparently great. Downwell, Fallout Shelter, Lara Croft Go, Monster Hunter 4 Ultimate, <laughs> Pac-Man 256. That's it. That's the list. One of these games is not like the others. Jesus Christ. Monster what? Hunter 4. <laughs> Monster Hunter 4 versus Pac-Man 256. Like, how... <laughs> How can you even compare those two games? 
I think that should be a Kotaku article. Monster Hunter 4 during, versus Pac-Man 256. The comparison. the comparison we had to make. <laughs> the comparison that nobody really wanted to make. <laughs> um, that's funny. But then there's no... I mean, I guess were there other good... Like, what? Jeez. I see no Pokemon Pit Cross on here. Steven says no that's box fun. Boy. Yeah, no, no box, box Boy. Yeah, no Box Boy. What the fuck, man? Yeah, yeah, wait a minute. There's still video games coming out. Why are the Game Awards well, on December third? that's the thing is that, like, and then Fallout 4 is a nominee. I mean, what the hell does that even mean? Like, Fallout, I feel like I still don't know what to make of that game. And, I mean, nominees were in a, Like, you know, people must have... I don't know. The whole thing is weird. Like, like I know so much about The Witcher 3. I have such a solid conception of that game. But Fallout 4, I just, like, don't even know. So how can you even say uh, yeah. that? Best it's narrative. It's all very strange. I'm going to keep, keep going seeing through people, these. I keep seeing... I keep seeing people tweet, uh, like other games reporters at other outlets tweeting about how they're putting together their game of the year conversations now, and it's just like wait, <laughs> like the we that's still always have, like, tricky. A solid, yeah, solid twenty five days left in the year. Before, to me, a lot uh, of that feels like habit. Um, I think we we get trapped in that too because we do a year interview thing, and I know Stephen is always a little bit like, God, do we really have to do this just because it's so like, do we have to do this just because everyone else is doing it? We get kind of like it can be fun to do that stuff, but it's definitely you're like, okay, it's December. It's time to do your interview shit. And we don't like think, well, but also like I haven't finished Soma. I haven't finished the Bloodborne DLC. I haven't played. I haven't finished Undertale. I haven't finished so many things. Why are we having this conversation now when we could wait at least until, you know, the end of the month to to give ourselves more time? But we're not doing games of the year. We're not doing that until January. And we don't do one game of the year anymore. That was a change last year. Which, which is phenomenal. Really good change. Yeah. <laughs> to just say, here's 12 games that were, we yeah. really liked this year. And honestly, like, to, to pick one among... I mean, how could I possibly pick between Bloodborne and The Witcher 3? Like, I loved right. both of those games. Um, and I Box Boy. No, and, and Box Boy. I have no way of making that distinction. And, you know, and I think about video games a lot. And there's just... I don't think there's a way to do it. I mean, you laugh, but I think Box Boy is, is just as excellent at No, it's doing a brilliant game. Oh, no, 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 I know, I know. I laugh just because it's a bit of a, like, the way that you always bring it up is funny. But um, it's well, a it's great a, game. Hey, it's a great gotta game. talk about Box Boy. Um, what about Trails in the Sky? I bet, I bet that's not winning any awards because nobody has actually played it. <laughs> right, and, <laughs> and so the, it didn't get nominated. It's very, it's funny how, how much marketing affects these awards because marketing affects what games journalists and media are actually playing and what they're playing turns into game of the year awards. Like if, if people had actually played trails in the sky, if journalists had actually taken the time to sit down and play those games, maybe they would nominate them for some awards. Yeah, but. I mean, it's like not totally fair to expect people to do that only because I mean, come on, it's like, especially with video games, they're right, a billion they're hours long and there's a million of them. Um, it's it's yeah. all like we're we've basically laid out a pretty effective case I think over the last twenty minutes for just how an award show is fun. It's not particularly meaningful. Um, I still kind of like award shows just because it lets us have like silly conversations like this one where we just kind of argue about which games we liked <laughs> and why. Well, I think that that does allow for a kind of insight into a game as much as it's muddled and all over the place. It's fun to talk about you know which games had an impact over you and. A year can feel like I can feel like a weird distinction. Like I always, it always bugs me when people say the best game so far this year. I'm like, okay, why? Why does it matter? You know, why does this frame of time matter? But at the same time, I get it. Like it, you know, you you need to draw a line somewhere. Otherwise, everything yeah. is going to be compared to everything else, and that's sort of just harder to do. So I see why they would do it that way. Are there any other good categories? Funny categories? I should look. Okay, Developer of the Year is a funny one. It is, and it's all it's like Nintendo, Bethesda. Oh, right? Nintendo! Oh, <laughs> yeah. Developer. Of the year. <laughs> you don't say. Um, it's kind of weird, actually. Okay, yeah. Developer of the Year. Oh man, you can probably guess them. Bethesda. Okay, wait. Let me guess. Yeah, let me all guess. right. Try I, to guess. I haven't. Uh, so Bethesda. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Nintendo. Yeah. Uh, CD Projekt Red. Yep. Yeah, how many more are there? Two. There's two more. Two more. Um, hmm. Uh, uh, Sony Jap- or from software? From software? Yep. Yep. <laughs> really? And one more, and you're gonna get the last one. one. Just think about it. What developer uh, would it be? Uh, like what studio? Um. Hmm. I can give you I don't a clue. Know what if else you want. Oh, Konami, Kojima Productions. Yeah, Konami? Kojima, Kojima Productions. That's developers of the year. Wait, so it's just the game of the year developers? Is that right? Yeah. yeah, maybe that's Those actually five. the rule. I guess that's kind of like, no, they don't do that with, with Best Director, do they? It's just usually the Best Director is also Best Picture. That's sort of similar, I guess. 
This developer uh, of the year is I weird. So. I mean, honestly, like I sort of like the idea, honestly, because I like recognizing developers. I think that's cool. Um, even though these developers are all don't really need recognition. I and I right. I think C D Project Red deserves some special credit this year just because they actually have done something really special with the way they've curated The Witcher Three and run that game. Like that game is I liked that game a lot when it came out and I like it way more now and it's largely because of the really special thing they've done with it after release and how great of a developer they've been. Though honestly, I think um is it Techland who made Dying Light? I think they should be nominated, man. Like Mm-hmm. Have you been? Have you followed that game much? That's another studio that reminds me of CD Projekt Red, and that they're constantly putting out cool new shit and talking to their players, and they're like obsessed with their own game after release in this really cool way. So that's actually kind of weird they're not on there. Well, it came out in January, so it doesn't count. Who cares? It was barely 2015. <laughs> <laughs> um, so okay, so we. I, I think The Witcher Three will win. Uh, game of the year. It probably should. I mean, I think Bloodborne, maybe on a design level, is the most impressive yeah. thing. But The Witcher Three is fucking incredible. I mean, I've, I've played that game yeah. all the way through twice now. It's just, it is an incredible game. Like I, it really, yeah, it it deserves it. I mean, a lot of the, all the games on that list were good in their own ways. But yeah, that game for me anyway was pretty special. Hey, you know what game you should play? What? Final Fantasy fourteen. I was not expecting you to say that. I was totally expecting you to say that. No, you were expecting me to say like Sweet Coden 2 or Trails in the Sky, both of which you still have not played more of. <laughs> Any other week I would have been expecting you to say that, but this week you've been this is like basically so for listeners, what what we we work in Slack, you know, in the chat thing, and basically my Slack interactions with Jason each day begin with him telling me to play some game or other. And this is just our relationship. And this week, that game has been Final Fantasy XIV, so I was very much expecting you to say that, though in another week, yeah, maybe a different game. Well, hey, I mean, if you play fourteen, we can play it together and, like, talk on PSN and uh, mm-hmm, shoot mm-hmm. the shit like we used to do back when we actually played Destiny. Yeah, it's funny that I... That's just... Man, I don't want to get side... But whatever, let's get sidetracked. I think that that is interesting, actually, that... Um, I Final Fantasy XIV will come back to you. I've I have played that game. I've got a character, and um, I do want to play with you. But uh, it's funny how we haven't talked because as much because we haven't been playing Destiny. And then this week we played a little bit of Destiny, and it was really funny. We loaded it up, and like it was like Mike and Adam and Russ and sort of the the guys we normally play with, <laughs> and just hearing them all again and kind of talking. I was like, oh, this is nice. My it's my friends. Like I haven't talked to them yeah. in a month, and it really. Um, it underlined for me the social pull that those kinds of games have. And, you know, I've never played MMOs, but I, I know that's a thing. But I really missed everyone, and it made me realize <laughs> I almost want to start playing Destiny again just because I kind of miss talking about movies with, you know, Mike Rougeau and, and Russ Freshtick and, and the other guys we play with. And, uh, yeah, I don't know. It was interesting. It, it just struck me. <laughs> <laughs> Did you miss telling people not to die? I didn't tell anybody not to die. I, <laughs> That's true. Um, I That's said true. something, but nobody because nobody died. Well, no, everybody died. It. Are you serious? Remember, we like well, did the Oryx. war priest challenge, and then like it was a mess, and people kept dying. Oh, That's and, true. Um, and uh, despite the fact I didn't, it was you know why they died, right, Jason? <laughs> because why? I didn't, I didn't tell them not to die. Oh, they forgot. Oh, right, they right. forgot they that forgot. they weren't supposed to die because they didn't have yeah. me to helpfully remind, to helpfully remind them. Yeah, man. Well, you're deputy editor now. You need to be telling everyone not to die. Right, I'll Kataka be commanding staff, it. Do not die. Okay, first, hi everybody. Good morning. Today we're all gonna not die. Nobody die. <laughs> first important directive from your deputy oh, editor. Oh man. Oh man. But uh, yeah, Final Fantasy fourteen. I mean, I don't think it'll be as like you can't chat as much as you can with Destiny because there's mm-hmm. actually a lot of story to read and like mm-hmm. uh, cutscenes to watch and whatnot as you're doing the main story quest. Do so it's actually one of it's an MMO that is really fun to play by yourself. Right. Do you think that that holds up after? I mean, I'm guessing you're maybe like in the twenty to thirty hour mark. Do you think that that holds up once you finish the story? Like, I have a feeling that that game that it, the usual thing is you play through the story. And then you start doing dungeons and raids, and when you're doing those, maybe it's easier to talk over. You start repeating things the same yeah, as you do in yeah, Destiny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you're right. Yeah, but getting there is like a way bigger commitment than it yeah. is in Destiny. When I played that game, I played solo almost all the time. I think we did a dungeon together and played some, but and it was it was cool because oh, that was fun. Yeah, we did yeah, that with yeah. Patrick. Yeah, it was fun. Um, and uh, not Klefek, we should say. Patrick Klefek does not Patrick play Final Fantasy yeah, fourteen from, from Life Hacker. Um, yeah, Patrick Allen. But we, uh, it, yeah, it was fun to play solo. I really like it. You just linked me, man. The music in that, the music in that game, 
is absurd. It's really absurd. Yeah, it's, it's such so a good, big man. part of the appeal. It's so good. All of it's so good. Um, um, that, yeah, I really yeah like so, that part of it. so the, one of the things they did, I believe, when Heaven's Ward came out, that's the expansion that came out mm-hmm. earlier this year, is they boosted all the experience on the older quests, so you level a lot faster now. Oh, really? Um, yeah, so it's easier because they want people to get up to the new stuff. So I've been playing through, I've been having so much fun this week uh, playing Final Fantasy XIV, and I think I'm going to stick with it for a little while just because it's like the music is so good and exploring is so much fun and like the story is legit. Um, I did a quest the other day. I'm still fairly early. I'm only like level 25, but Mm -hmm. I did a quest the other day uh, where you fight Ifrit, the summoning monster in the party, and that was really cool. What uh, what class Um, are you playing? I can't remember. I'm a tank, a gladiator. Oh, okay. Um, but the way it works is you can switch. Between yeah, you can cl- switch classes. Class. I'm trying to. It's like a job system, right? Like at a certain level, yeah. you can just switch classes. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And so, like, I was leveling up a conjurer, which is the white mage, basically, because you have to have a class and then a subclass leveled up mm-hmm. to get a job. Um, so, like, if I want to be a paladin, I have level thirty gladiator and level fifteen conjurer to get there. So. Uh, yeah, man, it's super fun. The music is so good. I'm like sitting there with my headphones on, rocking out. Like <laughs> I would, I was thinking I want to listen to podcasts or like do some watch TV shows or something while mm-hmm. uh, doing some of the arbitrary grinding and stuff and like killing monsters and whatnot. But I don't want to because the music is so mm-hmm. good that I just want to listen to it the whole time. Yeah, um, yeah, I found so that about it too. I mean, yeah, I like I spent this week. I wanted to play some Fallout. I wanted to play some Witcher. I wanted to play a bunch of stuff. But then I jumped into Final Fantasy XIV, and I was like, man, this is awesome. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> really yeah. Fun. So there's a promotion going on right now. I always get – it's funny. Like, um, I was talking to you about this last night, I think. that What's the promotions deal? It's like 96 hours free. Does that mean that from when you yeah. start you have 96 hours yeah. or that you have yeah. 96 total hours? <laughs> no. Uh, man, man, I wish it was like that. would be so much better. <laughs> they wouldn't make money. Um, yeah. And I was thinking about how much money it must cost to keep this game going because there's just so much writing and so many quests mm-hmm. and so much dialogue. And like, did they add man, that stuff or is, did they just do time. that all at once? Um, I I don't know. I haven't been playing long enough to know how much stuff they've added. But they added mm-hmm. like the Golden Saucer earlier this year mm-hmm. and Triple Triad. Triple Triad is so much fun. And uh, all this new Heaven Sword stuff that I'm excited and to check out. It sounds like Heaven Sword is amazing. I mean, Fahey was saying it's really, really good, which uh, was cool. Yeah. I got that installed now and want to check it out. Yeah, the story. I mean, the story so far, it's been really cool. I like it a lot. Um, mm-hmm. There's some, they're like characters that you get to know, and it's, it's very, uh, uh, like, it feels like Final Fantasy, even though it's an MMO. It feels mm-hmm. very much like, like, <laughs> it feels more like Final Fantasy than 13 did. Right. Um, and uh, uh, hopefully 15 channels some of what makes 14 great. Um, yeah, I, yeah, I'm definitely going to play more. We'll play together. We should. Uh, it's you know, it's a time thing as always, especially this time of year because there's a lot of other stuff I got to play. It's a time but, thing. But yeah, people yeah. always ask us what the hardest part of of this job is. <laughs> I think it's that there are too many video games. <laughs> it's definitely a challenge. Um, if you want to actually know what you're talking about, you have to play so many games. Yeah. Um, speaking of so many games. Uh, I played another Too game over break. Uh, you mentioned what it before. I, we were going to talk about it. Nina's game, Nina Freeman's game, Sibel, which Sibel. is yeah, which is interesting. Um, I thought it was I thought it was really cool. Uh, I uh, Patricia already wrote about it for the site. Um, we it wasn't really for coverage. I just had it on my Mac, and I knew it was pretty short, so I played it. And uh, do you know and do you know about this game beyond the fact that it's a sex adventure? <laughs> well, tell readers. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm is. just wondering if you know, but I'll, I'll tell you I, and readers vaguely. Thing. So it's um it's it's interesting. It's a game that uh is set it takes place on a desktop like on a computer desktop, which is a uh, sort of a trend this year cuz it's similar to her story in that way. And you're playing basically as Nina. So Nina Freeman, for those who don't know, she's an indie developer. She actually lives here in Portland near me. Um she works for she's working for Fulbright for Steve Gainer uh, making their new game Tacoma, but she also makes games on her own and uh yeah, and this is her new one. It came out, I'm not sure, but maybe a month ago or something on Steam. So uh, it's it's super personal and autobiographical. It's like a true story of the of basically her falling in love with a guy when she's like in, in college, so of like first love and sort of, uh, you know, losing her virginity to this dude uh, that she met in an online game. And I believe the game in was Final Fantasy Online in real life, but in the game, it's a made-up game 
that I can't pronounce the name, <laughs> but it's, you know, so you actually play this game in the game. So her desktop is kind of there. There's stuff all, you know, there's like folders and pictures of her and her friends and emails and you kind of can get, it's cool because you're, you're sort of looking through her stuff and reading and learning more about what's going on in her life and who her friends are just purely through her desktop, which is a smart idea that I think more games are exploring because we can learn a lot about a person just by looking at their computer desktop. But then you can also go into this game. And when you go into the game, you start playing with this guy, Ichi, who's the guy she's sort of falling for. And it has, I think, three chapters, four chapters. It's really short. I think I beat it in less than an hour. Beat it. I finished it in less than an hour. And uh, you play the <laughs> you play the game. It's uh, The game is really simple. You like walk around together and kind of click on things and kill them. So it's it's meant, I think, more as a, it's a sort of like metaphorically channel the feeling of just playing an MMO with somebody than to be a really meaningful game on its own. And then while you play, you hear this recorded VO where she talks to him and they're really awkward and super cute. And it's like them kind of getting to know each other. And just that that kind of... Oh, it, man. It, it's it's awkward. It's like an awkward game. Um, yeah, it's that like, feels like it would, it would be hard to listen to. Well, it's no, it's not. No, they do a good job because it, it is okay. it is acting. It's not. It doesn't feel totally real. Like, it's it's Nina performing her own parts. And um, I'm trying to think. There's a, It's an actor, I think, or another guy. I don't know who he is, who performed the part Troy of Baker. Troy Baker. <laughs> of course. Troy Baker <laughs> and Nolan North. Um, and, you know, it's just them. He's kind of an awkward dude. She's an awkward girl. You can tell that it's just they're young and it's it reminds you of when you were stupid and young and, and all of that. And it just is a neat game. It kind of um, didn't. I liked it. Uh, it ended a little abruptly, which I guess is kind of the point. Um, like I, I wasn't it's 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 like a quick snapshot of a moment in time. And as that, I think it's really effective as like a story with a theme or like a full kind of conception. There were times where I felt like it was a little underdeveloped, but um I, I, what it was doing was very cool, um, and I've never really played a game that's done that, though I'm guessing it's not the only one of its kind. Uh, it's neat. I really recommend people check it out. Uh, it's short. You can play through it, and it's, it's, it's on the kind Steam. of thing that if you... It's a really universal story, which is what I liked about it. It's something that I feel like anybody, you know, close to our generation or anyone who grew up with computers will really, like you'll feel it when you play it it'll remind you of things in your own life like of just the times when you met people online and stuff and i thought that was cool i like this sort of desktop game idea did you play her story i can't remember wait hold on sabella it's on steam oh yeah i thought you said desktop game yeah it's on steam it's a pc game how much is it uh i don't know like 10 bucks maybe oh that's a lot no i don't know is it (laughs) i don't know (laughs) That's, I mean, that no. Seems I've, like a lot for for a game that like this. I don't know who who knows what value is, but yeah, it that, seems. That's, I mean, I don't know if it should be more or less. I would pay ten bucks for it. Um, I mean, I got it on Steam Pass, so whatever. But uh, yeah, I liked it. Did you play her story? Sort of similar game. No, no. I, you should I play would that. like to. Yeah, you should play that's that. A, play them both. They're both interesting because her story is a similar setup. It's more of a like um deliberate narrative and less of a just sort of snapshot of time game but it's you know it's this mystery that you're piecing together by searching archival footage on an old uh pc right. yeah, yeah, the, yeah yeah so it's cool because it's a similar idea where the whole game takes place on a pc and you're playing on a, on computer, a pc yeah. so it's this kind of nice self-contained thing uh that i mean they're also <laughs> that's like a genre of movie now which i didn't even know i was watching um every frame of painting that uh that really good youtube channel and he was talking about uh, Tony, the guy who makes those videos, was talking about how that's a genre of film now that I haven't seen yet, but it's like a type of movie that takes place entirely on a computer desktop, which is, I think, the same idea, and is very smart. Like, I think that's like a really smart evolution of storytelling to do it that way, and it lends itself to games, obviously, really well. <laughs> we need a new genre, desktop desktop game. It kind of is. It's kind of is a, a genre. I, I was I was actually trying to think. Does the Minesweeper asking, count? Uh, no. Because it's just a desktop <laughs> game. It doesn't actually oh, make right. a desktop. Uh, um, right. Like, I feel like there have been lots of... This would actually... I've been thinking about this for an article. Like, how there have been a lot of computer desktops and operating systems within games. And how that's always kind of uh-huh. cool when games do that. And uh, and it's even becoming other whole games where they're based around a made-up operating system. It's always, it's always a neat uh, thing to see, I think. <laughs> the operating system game. Interesting. Yeah. See? Yeah. Video games can be so many things. Well, right. I mean, I want to see. Maybe we need a game <laughs> awards category for operating system game. That'll be that'll be the new category, and then <laughs> they would just add some games that you play through your operating system, like sort of like the indie game. Doesn't really make sense. 
<laughs> anyway, so that was a oh, cool man. game. That was a cool game that I played. Okay. I could talk about you all the games played, I'm playing uh, forever. You also played Just Cause 3, right? How's that? I did. I, I was mixed on it. I was really mixed on it. Um, more mixed yeah. than... I was sort of surprised at how glowing a lot of the um, acclaim on it was because are you are you hold on are you ever really surprised when there's glowing acclaim for a big uh, budget video game yeah <laughs> yeah when the game has a lot of like really clear flaws that th- that are that clear really and then though? i just see people uh, okay, saying this on. is the most after, fun thing i've ever done in my life after dragon age 2 i don't think you can ever be surprised when no uh, but you know what AAA i mean like of course of course yes 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 like everybody's terrible um i i, I mean like <laughs> no <laughs> it's not that everybody's terrible it's that video games just like something about them i think gives you stockholm syndrome where it's very difficult to really critically analyze a game when you've just spent 50 hours playing it and i, I think I, you tend to be higher on it because you've invested that much time yeah i mean i kind of think that with this game it's a little bit different I, I the sense that i got was that like this in so many ways this is a game i was i was challenged by this too just cause 3 uh so for people who don't know just cause 3 sequel to just cause 2 this game is pretty much about flying around this huge beautiful island blowing shit up um and the <laughs> it's appealing it's a really appealing game really appealing um i i said this in my review i don't actually actively find myself wishing a game were better very often because a lot of times i'm like all right well this is what it is I've got a million games to play. I've played a million games. I don't need this game to be any one thing or another. I'm just going to play what it is and then talk about it. Uh, with this game, I really, really wished that it had just been, I don't know, a little bit better. Um, it's so good when it's good. It's so cool. It's so appealing. Um, it has this like this charming cast of characters. It's gorgeous looking. It's When you fly around in this game, it's so awesome. And th- some of the things you can do in it are just incredible. And it it's just like, it's a lot of things that I love about games. It has a crazy tool set that it just gives you. It lets you just fuck around. It has no, you know, it, it is very un, undirected in a lot of ways. And that's so cool. But then it just has these problems that drive me nuts. It pissed me off so often that, you know, just the AI is a disaster. Like so often things fall apart. It doesn't perform very well on PC. The frame rate drops like crazy and it would crash for me all the time. Um, on consoles, it has lots of frame rate issues, and it's just not smooth to play, so it's sort of uncomfortable. And it, there were just so many things about it that bothered me, where I was seeing th- this brilliant game in there. It just, it really did kind of leave me feeling extremely torn. The whole time I was playing it, I kept going back and forth on it, like, I really like this game. Ugh, I can't stand this game. Oh, no, wait, it's actually really fun. Oh, no, I can't stand it, which is a, ch- a challenging thing to go through um, with a game like that, where you really want it to be better. And I picked up on some of that I think in some of the reception and then the way people talk about it people really want it to be good and you can definitely have a lot of fun with it I just it felt to me it felt surprising that people were a lot of people were willing to just let that be um enough which you know is fair if that if they had a great time and I I don't think they didn't have a great time I think anyone who said they had fun with it probably had fun with it uh I just I for my own take I was like this game has a lot of really obvious major problems that are worth talking about basically is it possible that other people just didn't run into the same ai and technical yeah, issues? yeah i mean that's always going to be an issue with an open world game like yeah maybe or maybe they're just better than i am i mean I, I got pretty good at it but it could well be that like if you're amazing at this game um you can pull off some incredible stunts and incredible shit and maybe they're just better um and yeah it could be that people had fewer performance issues or weren't bothered by them as much it's all subjective and it's all based on the experience you had i I, I I would be surprised, honestly, like the AI stuff and the just general chaotic jankiness of combat, those aren't things that I think only happen to me. Like, I think that's just the game and that it's very difficult to look at that stuff and not say, okay, this is not good. Like, this just is not good and here's why it doesn't work. Mm. But, you mm. know, I mean, I don't know. That's other people's reviews. My own take on it is it's a very flawed game that I still – I I gave it a not yet, which is our way of saying it's got technical problems. It, I, I would recommend it, certainly, um, to people who yeah, just so want that, a game to fuck around in. Like, it's very fun. That goes back to what we were talking about earlier and the mm-hmm. kind of definitive uh, uh, evaluation that we provide with the review. Um it, th- a game like that, I think, shows some flaws with the yes, no, mm-hmm. not yet system. Yep, I agree. And uh, and it makes me wonder if there should be a yes, but or a no, but or something yeah, like that. Yeah, or like I mean, it just it it definitely does. Um, it it eliminates some some issues with that. I think just because it's mm-hmm. not it's a game that I would, 
you know, it's the really it's the it's the way we think about it you know since our verdict is should you play this game and the answer is sure yeah like play this game um if as long as you know what you're getting as long as you know that what it is and what it isn't uh, absolutely people are going to do awesome stuff with this game it's funny it was made with a ton of heart it's huge there's a ton of shit to do in it um it's charming and cool and and then when it's really going i mean you gotta play i mean i guess have you played did you play this game ever i thought you played it at e3 or something like that i can't remember yeah i did i played it at judges week yeah i mean the 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 wingsuit you have in this game you have a wingsuit yeah, and a parachute and a grappling fun. hook it's amazing like the yeah. the work they put into balancing how you have to control your flight and pull yourself along is just unbelievable it's like one of the best mechanics i've ever you know well ever it's one of the best mechanics i've felt in the video game in a long time uh, mm-hmm. and so if you were into that i mean yeah I, re- I recommend it for all of that despite the fact that there are these big problems that kind of drove me nuts about it mm. it was made in new york by the way one of the few video game studios that's that's here in here in Manhattan. Are they? Is Avalanche uh, entirely in New York? Are they? They're no. Well, so they have two studios. They're based in Sweden. Yeah, uh, that's in what Stockholm, I, thought. I believe. Mm-hmm. And then they have a studio out here. And I actually I went and visited them a couple of months ago and uh, had uh, dinner with uh, a couple of the the head honchos there, mm-hmm. uh, the director of the game and the studio, and they were telling me all about how they want to get more game developers to come to New York and like <laughs> are fighting for tax breaks and whatnot, which is cool. It's cool to see New York uh, uh, based development studios. I hope that. Uh, if this game doesn't do well, I hope it doesn't drive them out or something like that. But um, when I visited, it seemed like they were all having fun. It seemed like a small studio. Uh, mm-hmm. Fun fact, fun, really fun fact. So I used to work for uh, The Onion back in the day. Um, I was an intern for their video team, and I worked in their office in New York. They've since moved from New York uh, they, they had an office in Soho, 736 Broadway. So they've since moved from there to Chicago. And Avalanche is now in the same exact office where uh, the Onion is. Oh, really? Is. It was well, funny, funny going and visiting that, them and being like, They got some of that onion mojo, onion mojo carrying over. Yeah, so maybe it's all satire. Uh, all of Just Cause 3 is just <laughs> well, they, and they, I, I mean, I should really say it's it's hard to... Not every game gives you a sense of the people who made it, but Just Cause 3 gives me a very positive sense of the people who made it. I think it's one of the reasons that um, I find myself, you know, wanting it to be better than it is and also liking it in general. Uh, It's a very, like, generous, good-spirited game. It really just has a great spirit to it. And you can tell the people who made it made it with a lot of love. Like, they really cared about it. It's not some corporate product. It's definitely, it feels like something that real people made that they cared about and that they wanted it to be super fun like them which is nice because not all games actually feel that way so it's uh, a yeah. really nice thing about it yeah yeah um and it seems like a small team so i don't know mm-hmm. i don't know i i won't speak to their development processes but uh uh maybe they were crunching a lot and yeah. had to hit a deadline and i'm sure it's time hard to... as hell to make a game like that work i mean i don't you yeah know, doubt that i i do I, I think they the last thing I saw, I've been kind of following it, they said one of the developers on Steam said they're working on a patch to address some of the technical problems. So hopefully it, they seem, it seems, based on the game, like it's the kind of thing they care, like that they do want it to work better. So mm-hmm. um, hopefully, yeah, hopefully a patch will come soon. Are really there, are to, there to any developers there. that don't care? Give me an example of a developer that doesn't care. Well... That's not what I mean. <laughs> um, no, you're supposed I mean, to say you know, something. like there are games that get released and whether the developer cared or not, the publisher or whoever tells, you know, whoever dictates that the game just doesn't get any post-release support um, or, you know, the, the problems are deemed too small to be worth fixing. And then there are right. studios that illustrate kind of above and beyond what we're used to. Things like we were talking about with CD Projekt Red, like CD Projekt right. Red has demonstrated something beyond most developers. It's not to say other developers don't care as much as CD Projekt Red. It's just sometimes actions speak loudly. And, you know, when a, when a developer does that after a game comes out and really puts in the extra time to, like, fix it and make it work as well as possible, that, that says a lot. And it earns a lot of goodwill from fans. Definitely. And I think people uh, uh, really underestimate how important that is to get that kind of, that that reputation that you're mm-hmm. one of the good guys in mm-hmm. gaming. Yeah, no, it's nice um, because I think people still feel kind of like burned by by big corporations. And the minute you you see that them act that way, like I, definitely in the response to CD Projekt, it, you, it, it's nice. It's still refreshing in this day and age to have anybody um, in any company that big treat you well, <laughs> treat a consumer well. It's kind of depressing that that's true, but it is nice. 
Mm. Hey, let's do uh, a couple of reader questions. Yeah, cool. We're yeah, we're going. We're, this is this is good. We're going long. We could just keep going. Yeah, let's do some questions. Well, we Hit skipped me. last week, so we should go. We should go a little long. Uh, yeah, that's today, true. I think that's true. Okay, fair. Let's do some questions. Hit me. Make it up. Make up with for last week with some ear goodness for the for the fans out there. Hey guys, says Alex Browder. Hope all is well. As I've gotten older, I feel I've become more cynical of game development. Years ago, if you had told me a new Rainbow Six or Battlefront was coming out, I would have been ecstatic. <laughs> Wait, pause. There's a new Rainbow Six out. Yeah, there is. It's out. It's a game. It's out. It came it's out. A video game. <laughs> um, now, says Alex, when games like this are announced, the first thing I think of is, I wonder how much the season pass will be, and mm-hmm. I'm sure there's no single player, etc. I've told myself this is because times have changed, and this is how it is now. But back when the GameCube was out, I thought that was the best thing in the world. Almost everything I played in that era was good to me. Games could still suck, but I knew when a big sequel was coming, it would, for the most part, be good. Um, but looking back, lots of people were let down by games then as well. Is it an age thing? Am I just more aware now that I can see and I can see how companies want to screw me? Uh, hmm. The TLDR is, does age make you more aware of companies' wrongdoings? Also, Alex says, I heard Kirk's dark side made Jason quit on Oryx <laughs> the other night. That's messed up, Kirk. That is yeah, not Kirk. accurate. In fact, Jason, you were the one who very wisely bailed first and uh yeah we were all kind of ready to go so it was not well, that yeah. time or my it's... my infamous terrifying dark side that apparently exists <laughs> didn't really have anything to do with it i, I like mean, this yeah. question oryx, oryx on hard mode sucks yeah yeah agree uh that's kind of funny that i feel like that question is what um i was kind of just talking about <laughs> it's like sort of picks up for that that same idea yeah I think yeah. that this is Alex. Uh, I think Alex's question to Al- answer your question, Alex. I think that age does have something to do with that, um, at least in so far as saying, "Oh, when I was a kid and a game came out, I was just always excited and knew it to be mostly good." But then when I look back, I see that people were disappointed in sequels then too. Like I think that yeah, age and just experience, life experience certainly plays a part in that. Like when I was a kid, I didn't understand how corporations and publishers worked. I didn't think about any of that um so yeah i think that to an extent that's true uh well also when you're a kid you you kind of kind of like you kind of play bad video games and think they're good because you don't really have that kind of critical sense right and there just were fewer games then like it just was Hmm. if there you know there just weren't that many games out um where now there are millions of them and they're way bigger so it's partly that it's partly that you know uh, the the model has changed we get we get bigger games that are more ambitious with huge teams making them, and that means there's more wrong with them when they launch. Post-release support is a thing that didn't even used to exist, so now they can launch a game and say, well, we'll fix it if it doesn't quite work right. The season pass thing is interesting. Man, I... Mm. I, I it, Have you ever bought a season pass? Uh, yeah. I Well, let me think. I've had to... I've been considering it more. So it's funny because in, you know, in our jobs, a lot of times we get the, all that stuff for free. They send it to us, and so we don't really have to consider it. But man, you know, I've been buying more games this year, uh, consciously, and then also just because <laughs> Ubisoft and Bethesda don't send us games, so we just, you know, buy their <laughs> games, and that kind of thing, which has been really good, I think, uh, in general. I'm, I'm really happy to be doing it. Uh, yeah. It's p- partly a luxury because, you know, we have jobs and can afford to buy games and also can rationalize to ourselves, okay, I need to buy this for, for work. But uh, yeah, like I bought um, Batman Arkham Knight for PS4 because the PC version was fucked up, and I was like, I just want to play this game. So I got it on PS4, 60 bucks to buy the game. The season pass for that game, I believe, is $50, was $50 um, mm. after after just paying $60. And it was a really nice um, reminder where it, it was not academic, that decision for me. And I didn't buy the season pass, which it sounds like you know the DLC has been kind of disappointing for that game but it was definitely like a reminder of holy shit these things have gotten expensive like that's almost as much as the game cost uh just to get a season pass and And when they were selling the season pass they also didn't say what was actually in it right right and a lot of times you don't know um you're buying it up front where like with a game like you know the witcher 3 to come back to that again i guess uh the season pass for that gets you one thing it gets you those two um you know kind of meaty dlc chunks and having played the first one i'd say it's totally worth it because it was amazing and i think feel like the second one will probably be just as good but you also we got a lot of free stuff out of that that sort of felt like a good a good compromise but um the season pass thing is 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 tricky i 
I think that that kind of thing and making these games more expensive has definitely made people grumpier, just in generally, just in general grumpier about all of this stuff, understandably so, because it feels like a lot of money, um, especially mm-hmm. when games are launching kind of broken or, um, you know, in, in not in great shape, but you're being asked to yeah. pay so much up front. Yeah. Yeah, it's a problem. It's so- um, It's... It's interesting because there are kind of two sides uh, to this to this question that yeah. we've experienced, both, like firsthand. And question the first side is that from the developer's perspective, video game making has gotten more expensive than other ever. And like to keep people employed long term, you need another source of revenue outside of the game. And mm-hmm. season passes and DLC like helps keep people employed. And then from the gamer's perspective, it's like companies are shipping more and more broken games and asking you to pay for things sight and scene and you just keep feeling like you're getting screwed over by by these big publishers so it's like this we're in this kind of like tricky uh uh quagmire that's only getting worse and worse over time as fans get more frustrated and games get more expensive to make and it, it kind of feels like there's no like like foreseeable way out yeah, it feels a little like inflation, right? The whole thing, it just feels like it's inflating and it's sort of fueling itself. And both things are understandable. Like you said, I mean, making a game like Grand Theft Auto V or something or, or The Witcher is a crazy undertaking. Like, that to do that is absolutely harder than making whatever GameCube game back in the day was. It's, it's an, like, orders of magnitude more complicated and challenging. Games don't work right. I mean, you know, even getting a game to ship sometimes feels like a miracle, I sense, from developers that I talk to. So that's understandable. And then, but then that's not, you know, from our perspective, and we generally cover this stuff from a more, you know, from a player-oriented viewpoint, that's not, it, that still doesn't mean that these games should be launching the way that they are and that it's forgivable or whatever for it to be okay for them to get your money up front and send you something that just doesn't work. Um, especially in the case of you know of of something like Arkham Knight, like on PC, which was so fucked up that they pulled it, and uh, you know it's good, really good that you can get a refund now for that kind of stuff. Um, but uh, yeah, I, all of it fuels that negativity. Which to get back to Alex's question, I think that is new. <laughs> That's not something you know. It's not just like you're older. It was the same back then. That all is totally a new paradigm. So well, there was no Twitter back then. That too. We didn't have immediate means of expressing our anger, but um. So yeah, I think it's it's obviously you know that's the the obvious answer is it's complicated and there are, there's a lot to it, but um. I think it's both. It's that we're older. It, it feels it feels in some ways like there's going to be a crash or a catastrophe of some sort, and that like like <laughs> doom and gloom is inevitable. Yeah, I wonder. Which is kind of scary. Yeah, I, I I mean, if it means that it's if that's the ultimate representation of a broken system which the broken system finally breaks and collapses on itself then that's actually in the long run not terrible even though it would be terrible you know it would mean a lot of people lose their jobs and a lot of bad things happen it's also any broken system that collapses on itself that's just going to happen and that's the way it Mm -hmm. goes and hopefully is replaced by something that works better uh but yeah i don't really know i it'd be interesting there's a lot yeah there's a lot that seems pretty dysfunctional about the current system so yeah, and it feels like I mean, there's a demand for higher and higher graphical fidelity and better, mm-hmm. better looking games and 60 frames per second and 1080p resolution, and that's all totally fair. But with it comes all these rising costs, and it's impossible to have one without like these publishers trying to make money in other ways. Through yeah, selling. it's tough. It it makes me think sometimes about like it. Part of it is a technology problem, and that it is a solvable in theory technology problem in that every game is reinventing the wheel every game is inventing its own tech every game has to like be trying new shit all the time if you know it's like it's it's you know this is a half-formed thought it's like if in movies you had to design the whole damn thing every time and you had to build your own new camera and your own new everything technique instead of just saying i'm gonna go buy a camera use all these kind of tried and true right. approaches and do a lot of pre-production and just know what I'm getting into with games. You just so often it's like, well, we're doing a whole new engine and a whole new approach and a whole new thing. And it's partly because games are such un- untested waters and people are always doing new stuff, which is what's exciting about them. But it's also the thing that causes each game to feel like this massive experiment and undertaking where in a world where there was just, you just 
could be creative within you know a framework which is kind of what game engines allow for to an extent as that evolves i could see that being a way out anyway mm. yeah that's an interesting point and and it does seem like people are having success well i don't know i mean there are games that try new things on on unity and uh exactly. unreal and mm -hmm. all these kind of middle or even engines. like rpg maker or like even simpler programs like that or twine i think know? all games should be made in rpg maker <laughs> <laughs> right uh, that's going to be the solution there will be a huge video game crash and then everything will just be rpg maker all the time dude i, I that would make me so happy yeah that that'd be, be interesting my I'd ideal be, video. I'd all, be all, all right with it. rpgs and visual novels that's what i that's the only thing i need yeah that'll be the more the games new, like trails in the sky the new era uh, you got, would we have one more question to do? Yeah. Uh, so uh, Gabriella Everett asks on Twitter, what role do you think games media will play in the success and failure of VR? Um, which we could also talk about just the success and failure of VR in general. Uh, uh, but what role do you think games media will play in it, Kirk? Whew, it's tough. Um, I've, you know, as someone who's got an Oculus Rift and has written about VR online, um, I, you know, I think the same the same role that tech media plays in anything in that you use the thing and are hopefully a good enough writer to convey your experience and inform people about it and tell them what the deal is and why it's interesting. So to just that basic level. But the, the question of how games media will cover VR is a really interesting one that I don't have a great conception <laughs> of. Because you know what I mean? Like, how the hell? Right. How do you review a, a – how do you – yeah, that's – how do you how do you get into a VR game and, like – well, and I show know. it. I, it's just there's no. The only answer is everybody needs to like everybody needs to have VR goggles that they can wear to watch your coverage of the game. Like you know, streaming video is the biggest thing for video game coverage online. Streaming video and, and animated uh -huh. you know gifs and streamable and whatever else, because the ability to demonstrate what's happening in the game at the same time alongside the written word, or even in the case of like a YouTube video in place of a written word is huge because it's so much closer to the actual experience of the game. So that same innovation for VR would mean everybody is, you know, wearing their, you know, fifth gen Google glasses that just convert into VR goggles and can just say, okay, boop, I want to see this game. And it just pops up on their glasses or whatever. And then they can have the experience because otherwise you can't get there. If it's not that you can't do it. Um, I'm, I really don't think like I've seen there are shortcuts like where you show the game, the view that I have, like if I'm wearing a headset and then you show my head like in the corner while I'm looking around like a moron, but that doesn't really convey what it's like to use VR. I mean, you've used VR, like you've worn those things. You can't get a sense of that without actually doing it. I just don't think it's possible. Well, so so I'm trying to think of like an answer to Gabriella's question about what role the media will play. And I'm wondering, like, do you think that the success of like PlayStation VR and like uh, Oculus Rift, et cetera, et cetera, will depend on whether the media says, hey, this is like revolutionary, buy it, or whether people are more tepid on it? I think it'll depend on, I mean, just like anything, yeah, to an, to an extent, I think that you know, the media will play an important role because they'll check it out and be able to talk about it, especially with new technology, because people don't want to just go buy something said and seen this headsets are probably going to be expensive. But really, honestly, I think that it's going to be word of mouth with that stuff. Like if they can set mm. up, if PlayStation VR, which I'm extremely skeptical about, and maybe we can talk about that on another podcast, but um, <laughs> if PlayStation VR is going to be amazing, with if they just set that thing up at every Best Buy in the country, at every Target, and you can just go use it, and it does the thing that the Wii did, where the first time you use it, you think, oh, holy shit, this 100% immediately makes sense to me. This just works. This is awesome. I want it. Like, if that's what it's going to be. Um, and I'm sure, you know, the media will play its part in saying the same thing. Oh, it's really cool. Go try it. But people will have to try it for themselves, because that's really the thing. Like, you have to do this for yourself. And then once you do that, you tell your friends, oh, my gosh, like, I got this thing. You got to come over and check it out. Or we got to go to Best Buy and, like, do this. You're not going to believe it. It's so cool. And it's going to be that kind of a thing, really, that'll lead to it succeeding or failing, I'd say. I mean, how could you not trust in PlayStation VR after the su success of uh, PlayStation Move and <laughs> Wonderbook and it, the yeah, 3D I mean, TVs that they were selling? The short and, version uh, of my take Vita. on that is that it's it's locking a virtual like virtual reality is still too un, un, underdeveloped to lock it to any kind of a like set hardware 
like the PS4. I don't think the PS4 is powerful enough for starters. Like they can do cool things, but I, this this technology is still, is not quite ready for prime time yet which isn't to say it isn't amazing but like it's gonna be on pc like it still needs to be on pc for quite a while to fully realize what it's going to be about and by the time that happens the ps4 is going to be ancient hardware wise and i just there's this will be a at best a cool you know a cool dalliance that people can get to play like cool weird games on but it's not going to be the transformative vr thing that i think feels possible at least if not likely but maybe possible when you use an oculus because that's going to happen on pc that's still going to be on pcs at least for the foreseeable future that's my take anyway my hot my hot tech take your hot take yeah man it's going to be expensive and it's yeah, going to be it's cool niche. but it's also going to like it's going to shut people away from the world and like who wants to be sitting there and like like it's bad enough like i get enough trouble with my girlfriend for sitting there and putting on <laughs> headphones and talking in destiny like i can't even imagine shutting myself out by putting on a vr headset like i, I don't I don't know the mo- like I I trying to be optimistic and like keep an open mind, but I just cannot imagine ever sitting there and like like sit for an extended period of time playing a video game with a giant headset on. Well, you know right, I mean? and that's I mean that's the question, and I think that that's always the kind of thing with a new type of technology where you don't know what the answer looks like until someone shows it to you, and then you say, oh, this is the answer. Like yeah, the huge headset. Maybe the huge headset isn't the end game of VR, right? It's how we've always pictured it, but maybe it's something much less intrusive. Uh, HoloLens is that kind of an idea like maybe it's just it's comfortable to wear and easy and it just allows you even to still be present in the room that you're in while looking at you know the game that you're playing like it the the technology is not there yet Um, even Mm. though the actual the conception of it like the concept when you use VR is there you think oh okay like if I was in a game with zero latency moving my head around and exploring a space that's fucking incredible and that's like nothing i've ever done before that feels like okay we're gonna do this one way or another the question is what's it gonna be and it's not gonna be until you know we'll know it when we see it um you know we're not probably gonna be the guys to come up with the idea but uh but yeah i i feel you on the headset thing like that so wait so do you think i mean do you think these companies are like blowing their rods too early I think I think Sony is yes. I think that the I think that PlayStation VR is Why too Sony early. and not Oculus? Because Oculus is still I mean I don't know quite I don't have a full notion of the uh, the consumer version, but I don't even think they're they, doing I, the they're doing the same sort of thing where they launch yeah, like in the early half of next year. But it's on year. PC and so as a result it's like just much more open and much more open to developers coming up and hacking it and coming up with new ideas. Even that is like it's more of a niche thing. Sony marketing it as a console peripheral consumer device strikes me as premature. Um, I, it doesn't mean like I'm. I admire how Sony does that stuff. I guess as long as they don't go out of business, like they can keep trying to do this stuff. I don't mind. Um, it just doesn't. Seeing it on PC, it just the whole thing feels more open to me. It feels more open to developers. It feels more open to people coming up with interesting things to do with it. But even that right. is just a step. Um, where. The problem, like I was saying before, the problem with it on PS4 is that it's going to be locked to that hardware. Like, you know, and, and that hardware is not powerful enough. Like with the Oculus, I can go buy a hella graphics card and like an amazing, super powerful PC that can do some amazing shit at really high resolutions and really high refresh rates. The PS4 can't do that. Like that thing is stuck and it's never going to get any faster. And so to me, tying your VR headset to that kind of hardware is crippling yourself where the oculus Mm. doesn't have that problem Hmm. okay uh let's do a couple more questions i got a few more on twitter that we can kind of uh uh run through cool real quick um we're going a little long today because uh because we have to we have to make it up we didn't have one last week we're making it up to you guys thanks for sticking with us this is our special thanksgiving post thanksgiving hangover episode right this is our meat hangover episode um, someone asked. A couple of people have asked about Final Fantasy fifteen, uh, which uh, there isn't much to talk about there, other than, I guess, the developer said on a forum that they have a playable version, start to finish, and right now they're just working on polishing and finishing things up, which is like, okay, woo, congrats, Mazel Tov, you did it. <laughs> so, the, will you, the next big news you, be it's gone gold? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> That's the thing, right? Um, yeah. 15, I don't know. I don't really want to think about that game until 
so the Square is doing a thing in March where they're going to announce the release date. So they're going to have a, an, <laughs> an announcement of the announcement party. Mm-hmm. Um, and I presume that it'll be like in March they say, hey, we're releasing this in, I don't know, September, something like that. And then we'll think more about Final Fantasy XV. I'm excited to review that game. I'm excited to sit down and, and spend time with it, but yeah, I don't know. Looking okay, forward to playing it. Wow. I haven't even played the demo. I'm I'm actually kind of fine to just not play it till it comes out. So yeah, unfortunately, yeah, I don't have many thoughts demo. about it. Yeah, it's it's not, you don't really need to play it. I think it's mm-hmm. more for like people who are been waiting for this game forever but mm-hmm. no there's nothing in the demo that it, it's cool i mean you saw the yeah Remu yeah, yeah. Video, that video right? felt like enough to me to watch that ridiculous yeah. super move and then be like all right that looks cool i'll play it when it comes out yeah someone else on twitter is asking about danganronpa 3 um they just announced like an anime and a couple new details of it it seems like this is gonna conclude the story in some way danganronpa man 3. can you imagine okay my thought on that is um, first, I'll have to go read like a wiki rec- recap of Danganronpa 2 because I've totally lost all the mess up crazy shit that happened in that game. Um, uh-huh. But can you imagine they're going to have a third one that actually is going to pull all of that together? And it's going to be like the Matrix Revolutions. It's going to be the most like twisted, convoluted that story. I mean, I'm psyched. I'll Wait, it, hold but... on. But the second one is, uh, let's, spoiler warning for Danganronpa 2. So if you haven't played that, skip ahead. Um, the, it was all VR, right? It was all they were all in this virtual reality. Island. Well, yeah, but it brought together all of the original cast at the end and had like your protagonist, right, and the main protagonist. I mean, I I really don't fully remember what happened because it was so out there. But it was really it was really abstract. It wasn't, but it wasn't neatly tied up at the end. Like oh, okay, and none of that really even happened. It was all virtual. Like it seemed like no, no, it, it was made it even more complicated. T- it ended with you with everybody in these like uh like pods and mm-hmm. that was the reality and uh uh like uh what's his face makoto naegi and his crew of the future foundation came in to rescue you guys from the mm-hmm. virus um the jungle virus and yeah i don't know we'll 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 do a danganronpa an all danganronpa I, episode i'm mainly laughing because out. like what worked about danganronpa 2 was that 90 percent of the game you didn't need to know anything from danganronpa 1 which was uh-huh. actually good because danganronpa 2 was fine on its own and then now but then the end was this like, hilarious clusterfuck of like lore explosion and i'm just picturing danganronpa 3 like what can they do that would be i think it was like a clever approach in danganronpa 2 right to to divorce it from everything that happened in the first game and then cleverly kind of tie it back together as much as it was kind of a mess. Um, it was a fun mess, just like the rest of Danganronpa. But what can they even do in Danganronpa 3? And I haven't looked. Maybe they've already said, but I haven't looked at the... I don't want to watch trailers for it. I just want to play it when it comes out. But um, well, they I mean, still I'm excited. Need to resolve, I'm excited. They still need to resolve all the stuff that's like the whole world being destroyed and like... The, yeah, well, and like, the... <laughs> I mean, they have to resolve so much. Uh, I mean, but they have to also, I'm sure it'll be on format, right? It'll be a group of kids and you'll, they'll be killing each other and having trials and, you know, Monokuma will be there and trombone solos will play and it'll be that thing, which is, so I wonder just how they're going to flip that out a third time and then resolve it. Yeah. I mean, I'm, other than my main thought on Danganronpa 3 is I'm excited as hell for it and we'll play it the minute (laughs) it comes out. (laughs) So yeah, man, there's a lot of 2016 is, is going to be yeah. a crazy year Between it's going to be good and persona yep. and yep. final fantasy 15 and new deus ex and i don't know yeah what else the, is it was, i was just year. thinking about the new deus ex well uncharted it's coming out and that's exciting uncharted, um, well, and also yeah. the, you know what i'm excited for is there's going to be the big witcher dlc pack is going to come out pretty soon that's going to be awesome like i honestly like the, the that's the what first, you're most excited about i'm pretty damn excited for it i'm serious like the the last witcher dlc was so good it was some of the best dlc i've ever played for a game just because it was so fun and smart and good and cool that the the fact that they're making even more just does make me very excited so that is one of the things i'm really looking forward to next year but that'll be maybe that can mm-hmm. be the subject of, a, of an upcoming podcast <laughs> witcher witcher i'll no I'll just witcher. what no 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 what we're excited for 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 2016 oh you want to do that one well yeah, okay. maybe i don't know maybe not maybe we should do our own game awards oh that's not a bad idea awards. what do we give like most anticipated <laughs> is that a category <laughs> at, at, at the game check awards? is that remember. do you still have do you still yeah, have yeah, the game awards have it check. Is there that's the worst category that's my probably my least favorite category most anticipated can we go through some more of those categories and make fun of them <laughs> best well we, we're, we're we've gone so over 
We're out of time. We can do that. Or I guess, no. Yeah, most anticipated game. All right. We're going to end on this. Most anticipated okay. game. Let's see what it is. Okay. Oh, God. <laughs> Wait, All can right. I guess? Uh, yeah, sure. Am I get, how many are there? One, two, three, four. There's five. Okay. Final Fantasy 15. No. No. What? So you're going to laugh at the ones that are included over that game, too. <laughs> Uncharted 4. Yes, that's one. Um, hmm. what else is coming out next year? What's one of the, uh, okay, No I'll Man's give, Sky? Yep, that's two. That was the, I was going to okay. give you a hint on that one. Okay. Um, is it any of the ones I just mentioned? Like, I'm gonna, I'll give you a clue for the next three. Two of them okay. are PS4 exclusives, and one of them okay. is an Xbox One exclusive. Okay. Or at least an Xbox so, exclusive. Xbox exclusive. Is that, uh, ReCore? Is that Mm-mm. one of them? No, what's an Xbox exclusive that's coming out next year? Halo about, Wars? No, <laughs> that would be awesome. <laughs> Halo Wars. No, I think it's like a. It's kind of a weird game that like Crackdown. Um, no, uh, that nobody really knew what the heck it was. It's from a developer who's made a really famous series in the past. It had a protagonist who I thought that his name was really amazing, but it's actually not as amazing. It's kind of a TV show oh, and a game. Quantum Break. Quantum Break. Yeah, that's on this list over Final Fantasy 15. I'm not really anticipating that game. I mean, okay, I'll, so I'll the other it. ones must be two Horizon. Two PS4 exclusives. Yep, that's one. Horizon and The Last Zero Guardian. Dawn. Yep, you got it. And The Last Guardian. So Those hold aren't on. the games I'm, I'm anticipating really. In. <laughs> Man, The Last Guardian is going to suck. Mark my words. I'm it's going to suck. Ex- I'm extremely worried <laughs> i hope it doesn't suck um, but yeah I, I hear you wait hold on hold on so final fan uh, here here's a list of games that is not on the vga's most persona 5 <laughs> persona 5 final fantasy 15 um uh uh what, what else were we just talking about deus ex yeah deus um, ex is hold on right. i'm gonna pull up a, a list of video games that dangarampa how is dangarampa no <laughs> nowhere on this list <laughs> Yeah, Horizon um, Zero Dawn looks cool, but I don't know why. I mean, that's not over some of those games we just listed. Not for me, but I mean, this is why. I mean, this is a stupid category, but Zelda Wii U. Yeah, what? <laughs> that, yeah, that even seems like it should be on there. Dark Souls Three. Hmm. Hmm. Battleborn. How is Battleborn not in this list? <laughs> or what about what's the one? What's the the epic one? What's that game called? Cortex or something? Codex. That they keep no, introducing Paragon. 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 <laughs> How is Paragon, Paragon not on here, man? That's like way more anticipated than any of the games we've said so far. Fire Emblem Fates. Okay, ah! this is nonsense that that game is not on this list. Yeah. XCOM that, 2. Honestly, I'm as excited for a new Fire Emblem game as any of the other games that we've said. I'd actually forgotten that, but I, yeah, that's in I February, already claimed right? it on our on our release sheet. Just so you Fuck, know. I'm excited. Oh, you claimed it? Oh, that's fine. I'll just play it. Yeah. I don't need to review it. Um, Bravely Second. How is that on, not on the list? Uh, I don't know. After the end of Bravely <laughs> Default, I'm like less less psyched about that. Way more psyched about Fire Emblem. But uh, well, Fire hold Emblem on. There's good. no way that they're gonna do that same nonsense that, right, that right, they right, did right. for Bravely no, yeah, Default. Be good. Like, it'll um, be good. yeah, the Deus Ex game, and then a lot of like other smaller stuff. Dishonored Two. How is Dishonored Two yeah. not on the list? Weird list. Wait, a lot of exclusives. Maybe it's like tied up in that. I don't know. People voted for that. Why is Quantum Break on that? Who's excited about Quantum Break? Not to shit on that yeah, game or anything, but like, I don't know anything about it. It looks stupid. It looks weird. I'm not interested yet. <laughs> like, so definitely not most anticipated game of 2016 interested or anywhere close. So whatever. Yeah. Overwatch, maybe? Although I guess that's kind of out. Kind of now. feels almost like it's out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm psyched for it to keep being out and to get better, but yeah. Gears of War 4, well, I guess, yeah, whatever. Doom. Um, mm, Doom, not as excited. Gears, I'm, I'm excited. I'm always psyched for a new Gears game, but uh, Doom this doesn't look awesome. We'll see. Yeah, so, I mean, we base Mass Effect Andromeda, how is that? Is that really? List? That's not going to actually come out next year. No fucking way. Well, They're going to announce it's... it or something and then delay it like that. Yeah, well, so, yeah, I mean... At E3, they'll probably do a big blowout at E3 yeah. next year, and then delay it and delay it to September. February or March or yeah. something of 2017. Yeah, like for that, sure. there's I can't imagine them being like it's coming this fall and then it actually comes out in the fall. It just doesn't seem like that ever happens anymore. Yeah, Square Enix has a bunch of cool JRPG stuff coming out next year, like yeah. uh, this game Project Setsuna that looks really interesting. Mm. Um, 
and Star Ocean Five. Hmm. Uh, some Dragon Quest games are coming to 3DS. Some ports of older Dragon Quest games. But anyway, yeah, I mean, it's gonna be a, a packed year. Yeah, it'll uh, be good. It's weird how like I, list it's weird how 2015. I, I I mean every year is packed. Every year is exciting. It's weird how in some ways 2015 feels disappointing only because the fall games were disappointing. But 2015 was not disappointing. So yeah, I mean it, there were so many good games. There's so many good games every year. Every year I say the same thing. Well, wow, there were like a billion cool games. So sounds like that'll be good. Kind of an impossible yeah. award to give, I guess. But uh, we'll see. We're going to cover yeah, that. So that's tonight. So. The Game Awards are tonight. I guess I should know that. I do know that. We're covering it. That'll well, be fun. this is coming out on Friday. So it yeah, we're, it's Thursday right now. So yeah. Last People night. have already seen. Uh, we didn't really make any predictions. Oh, we predicted The Witcher 3, Game of the Year. That's our prediction. Our one. There will be some news announcements too. And like Game Keely's Awards. always good about getting the exclusives and the trailers and the announcements. Yeah. Um, and then also Saturday is PlayStation Experience, so there will be yeah. some some cool news there. I think Destiny some news. Some Destiny news, yeah, some Destiny news. Hopefully something cool and not something disappointing. They're like, we're bringing back Gallarhorn, and that's the whole thing. <laughs> that's the only news. <laughs> yeah, well, so I'm still very curious about how their plan is going to lay out over the next oh, yeah. year until the fall, because uh, it, it was interesting. There was like a minor, um, a minor little thing, minor little controversy no not even not a controversy well so i had reported remember that uh there would be no paid dlc and that they're going to do microtransactions for cosmetic stuff Mm -hmm. um and then GameSpot, uh they quoted this kind of markety speak uh from activision's most recent investors call from eric hirschberg at activision saying we're going to do dlc we're going to do like microtransactions and expansions Right. Mm-hmm. And there was like a, a little bit of a hullabaloo where some people were like, oh, Jason, you were wrong because you said they're only doing they're not doing the paid DLC this year. Uh, they're doing not doing the expansions like that. And I think there's a little bit of confusion over what an expansion actually means and what they're actually going to do. So here's my understanding real quick of what they're going to do. Okay. And some of this might have changed. This is just based on what I heard uh, a couple months ago. Um, so they're going to keep doing like the Halloween stuff where they have cosmetic DLC and like fun seasonal events and stuff like that. They're going to sell like skins and sparrows or whatever, like cosmetic stuff. They're not doing big expansions like they did uh, last year. So there's mm-hmm. not going to be like the $20 DLC drop. Um, they, they're going to do content drops, but – and. I had heard that they're going to be free, but that may have changed if they're not making enough money or they want to make more or whatever. So, Mm -hmm. like, I can imagine them doing a big January content drop, and maybe that'll be free, and or maybe it'll be five, ten dollars or whatever. But it's not going to be the size of like the Dark Below and House of Wolves. Mm -hmm. So, my understanding is that the next expansion, and this word is kind of weird with Destiny because is the was the Taken King an expansion or was that a new game? Like who, it kind of felt like a new game. Right, right, right. Um, but my understanding is that the next expansion will be next fall, the big one, what they call internally Destiny 2, although I doubt they'll actually call it Destiny 2 because that would right. confuse the hell out of everyone. <laughs> right. But that, to my understanding, is going to be the next big paid thing. You pay $60 for it. Up until then, there could be microtransactions. There could be smaller things that they sell. My understanding back in the day, like a few months ago when I reported on this, was that they were going to give away a lot of the content. Um, I guess we'll see this weekend what, yeah, what they I'm announced. interested. I mean, I could definitely see them going the route of like, like I, everyone sort of is predicting at least something where we're going to get a new version of Vault of Glass or the other, or Crota's End, like a new updated old raid. That's the kind of thing I could see being free. If they do, I really hope that they release a new raid at some point this year, just because it would take something on that scale, I think, to bring me back. And I'm guessing I'm not alone in that, that like we've kind of totally waned on playing the game. And to get me back, it's going to take more than just some year, more year one exotics and like a slight bump to the level cap or something. Like it's going to take something really new for me to go play. And yeah. if they did release a whole new raid, I'd be pretty surprised if it was free. But I mean, I don't know. Yeah, it, like like you said, I guess it could have changed. I don't think they're going to release a raid. I mean, I the stuff that they had been working on. I mean, I don't know. It, it's like you read the story that I published. Yeah, it takes I know. Them so long, it's so yeah. hard for them to make stuff. I don't think right. they can really afford to be 
making stuff during the year when they have to worry about what they're right. releasing next fall. Especially when, based on your story, was that everything they've released so far has been reused in some way or repurposed from that they'd already made it. Like, the Dreadnought was, like, originally conceptualized as part of the main game. Um, so based on that, right, now everything they're making is probably entirely new. Like, they're, so that's even harder. Like, that's even more work. So, yeah, that, that does make sense. Like, the idea of them releasing a new raid along with... Uh, working on whatever is coming next fall. I mean, they've gotten really big. Yeah. They are a very, very big studio at this point, so they have a lot of capability, but it'll be interesting anyway. Yeah, and I think I think they have a team that's just a live team, but I think yeah. the live team is working on stuff like what the Festival of the Lost was. And yeah. that was super cool. That was really awesome, the way yeah. they did that. Um, and maybe they'll do more stuff like that. Uh, mm-hmm. They do have some stuff that they banked away from... Uh, uh, the pa- like previous stuff like uh the pyramidian i think it's called on mars like a mars area with a raid there uh-huh. um and the european dead zone so that stuff we'll see in the future right. um but yeah uh it it will be interesting and i guess we'll see on saturday what they announce for yeah, now what the next thing is Hopefully they talk about the future. I really, it would be really nice. Maybe they haven't even made decisions about what they're going to do. Right. But it'd be nice if they were more upfront about their plans. Yeah, I think. I think enough people are wondering that this sort of feels like a good time for them to to come out and do that. And they've been so much more communicative this year and so much faster on stuff that hopefully that bears out in how they do this. I'd I'd love for them to say not only you're getting this, but also maybe in the weekly in a new in a blog post or something just lay out more of a vision for the next six months because everyone's wondering i know i'm wondering is there going to be any reason for me to come back to this game yeah i mean maybe if the answer is no then they don't want to well (laughs) well that's true that is a good point i mean yeah i mean i think the fact that they haven't talked so much about i mean anything could change on saturday when they announce stuff but uh i i think i don't think there's gonna be a ton between now and next fall Mm-hmm. That's just the sense that I got from, mm-hmm. from reporting on all that. Um, but yeah, we'll see. We'll see how it goes. Um, so I think that'll do it for this week's episode. Um, some quick housekeeping. Uh, if you like the podcast and if you got this far, you better like the podcast. Make sure you subscribe <laughs> to us on iTunes. Uh, leave a review. We need lots and lots of reviews. Um, we laugh every time we read one, and it calls us uh, hipsters or biased. <laughs> Those are my favorite. We're these, just guys, biased. these guys are biased. Biased. I don't hipsters. know what that means. What does yeah, that mean? We, that means we're, we're biased. human beings. It means we're human beings. Right. Literally, it means we have that's the same as saying these guys seem like human beings. <laughs> that's these that's guys, all that means. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> these guys seem like people. Um, leave us some reviews if you would like to submit questions. For the podcast, you can email us at splitscreen at kotaku.com. Uh, Kirk Hamilton, deputy editor. Congratulations yeah. again, man. Thanks, man. It's very exciting. I'm psyched. Running and, the shit uh, out of Kotaku. We're just running that thing. Running it running uh, it hard. So we may or we may not have outro music right now. Yes. We don't know If you're yet. hearing it, I hope you like it. If not, you will hear it next week. Okay, well, cool. I'm looking forward to hearing it because I still haven't heard it. <laughs> it's it's great. It's going to be great. You're going to love it. All right. Thank you all for listening. Mm-hmm. Farewell. Take care, everybody. Goodbye.